It's good to see you this morning, and uh, we're glad that you're here, those who were able to make it. Uh, the weather outside is frightful, um, but uh, it's Michigan, and here we are uh, in the middle of January, and so this is to be expected. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning uh, to Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to have you put your finger there as we go a little further in the New Testament to Matthew chapter 4. So I'm going to have you do a little bit of uh, exercise, some calisthenics with your fingers this morning, holding Matthew chapter 13 and also finding Matthew chapter 4. Let, let me explain myself. Um, in Matthew chapter 13, we have this uh, grouping of of parables, uh, there are actually, well, there's actually nine parables totally, but seven of them are parables of the kingdom. Uh, last week we read about the sower, the person who was planting the seed, and we read how the seed fell upon different plots of ground and the condition of those particular plots where the seed was was falling and there were there were seeds that um, sprouted but didn't amount to anything uh, there was uh, for an example seed that fell on the pathway that ended up as bird food and that certainly wasn't what the sower had in mind as he went out with his precious seed uh, which we learned from the book of Luke uh, the seed is the word of God, okay? So these parables are, are really uh, allegorical. They, they have meaning uh, pointing to the particular components of the story that have significant, have significant meaning. So um, because of the fact that one of the stories, one of the parables is not in Matthew, uh, we're going to take a look at it in Mark chapter 4. So let's go to Mark chapter 4 first. And we're going to be reading from verse 26. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise and... Um, day after day, night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow, and he doesn't understand exactly how that happens. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, that same farmer, that same person, uh, puts in the sickle and he harvests because the time of harvest has arrived. Now you, you might read that and say, well, that, that's kind of simplistic. And to be honest with you, I think that's part of the lesson here. Uh, you don't have to have a degree, you don't need a PhD in horticulture to understand uh, how seed germinates, that's kind of a, that's a little more of an advanced word than how you think as a child perhaps. But the seed germinates and develops and pushes its way through the soil and uh, the sprout turns into the full blade. Uh, it begins to take and develop a form of a of a fruit pod to whatever to whatever the particular seed is. And uh, I, I mentioned last week, and I, I do think they still do this, uh, but in school, uh, especially around the time of Mother's Day, uh, children are given a styrofoam cup. When I was a kid, they were Dixie cups, and you put some dirt in there and, and a seed, and you water it. And I know that I was always the one thinking I could speed things up by watering too much, 
And, uh, but anyway, uh, those cups are placed in the classroom window so the sun can shine upon them. And next thing you know, there's, there's something green, greenish, pushing its way through the soil. And um, unless if you knew ahead of time what it was that you were planting, uh, it could be a surprise. But nevertheless, as it comes forth and develops into a plant, uh, it becomes a gift for mother for Mother's Day. How many of you have done that in, in class at school? See, they still do that. Okay. Um, well, uh, if you were in kindergarten or first grade, you, you didn't need to... You didn't even need to know the word germination, okay? And yet, it took place. Uh, you didn't need to take that little cup home with you and watch it day and night. No, the seed had been planted. You left school that day, you went home, you slept, you woke up the next day, and if you were excited about your project, you maybe came into class and took a look at it and such. But for the most part, when a person casts seed into the ground, they let it be, and they sleep and awake day after day, night after night, and nature takes care of itself. It's, it's kind of interesting that it says that the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. And it's kind of interesting in the original, the words that are used there, but um, it doesn't need any help. And this thing of, of nature, as we would call it, um, bringing life from a seed is typical. Well, um, unless if you see things as they truly are, it's really a miracle. Um, we try to use fresh seed when we plant our gardens because we know that it's, it's a good idea to not have something that's terribly old. Um, I, I brought this last week, and, and I told you that um, this is Indian popcorn from my grandmother's garden, and grandma has been gone now for probably 25 years. But if you were to take these seed from this cob of corn and plant them, they would grow. <laughs> after 25 years, and they're hard and dry, okay? And I, I can say that with confidence because this particular ear of corn came from seed that my Uncle Paul had grown when he was a boy. And I happened to find these little ears of popcorn in my grandmother's cupboard and they were so old, they smelled musty and dusty, and you know how old stuff, you ever go to the cupboard and get a cracker or something, and you realize after you've been into it, that's been there a long time, and it's, it's really too old for, for consumption, it's really too old to eat. This popcorn that my grandmother had in her cupboard smelled, smelled old. I'm not gonna say horrible, but it smelled old. And Grandma took that after all of those years. My, my uncle had gone into the military and served in, in Germany and such and was married and had children of his own. Grandma planted that popcorn as old as it was and got this. And that's, that's for, that ear of corn is larger than what she found in her cupboard. Now, by the way, uh, just a little something that you may not have known. Did you realize that in the pyramids in Egypt, <coughs> where they had buried the pharaohs, along with the pharaohs, they had buried things <coughs> because of their belief system for the pharaoh to use and to enjoy in their next lives. And they found tomato seeds. Tomato seeds that were 4,000 years old, roasting in the deserts of Egypt, and they planted them and got tomatoes. And you could, you could take that seed apart and you could 
find all sorts of fault with its condition and how old and, and, and dry and everything that it was. And crazy enough, no, miraculously enough, there's life in that seed. Such is the kingdom of God. And you may not realize the power and the miracle of the seed that God has cast into the earth, and yet that seed, when it is received, as we spoke last week, it is capable of springing forth not only into a living plant, but into life everlasting. That's why the parable that we shared with you last week is so important. It's kind of a, it's kind of a legend parable for these other parables of the kingdom. If you've ever used a map, and I realize that today with our phones, uh, we, we just use Google and find out where we're going and such, but if you've ever used a map, over in the corner of the map there will be a legend, and it will say things like, one inch equals so many miles. Uh, it will show you a little symbol of an airplane, and that indicates that on the map there's an airport there and so forth. And the legend helps explain so that as you're using the map, you're able to kind of figure out what's going on and what to expect as you travel. Well, the parable of the sower is a legend by which we understand, and in fact, it's kind of interesting, but here in the Gospel of Mark, and it's verse 13, uh, the disciples of Jesus came to him and they said, could you explain to us the parable of the sower? And here's his words. You don't know this parable? If you don't know this parable, how will you understand all parables? And so he went into detail, as we did last week, and he explains that, yes, the sower sows the word, and the plots of ground are the conditions of different hearts upon which that seed is sown and how it is received or, in certain cases, rejected or ignored. And yet, when it is received into the ground, into the soil of the earth, that seed has the opportunity to grow. And by the way, that relates to what we have in John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to those he gives the right or the power to be called children of God, even to those that believe on his name. And I, I want to say this morning, in the regard of the message of Christ, and in the regard of this good seed of the gospel, I, I guess I want to ask, have you received that seed? Have you given what has been sown into your life of the Word of God and from the Word? Have you given it a place in your life and considered what God seeks to accomplish in you? And not just for this life, but for the life that is to come. Have you taken the message of Jesus Christ seriously? Uh, you're aware, perhaps, of the historical Jesus and realize that some 2,000 years ago, yes, there was an actual man, a boy that came, if you will, stumbling out of Nazareth, claiming to be the Son of God who grew up to be, and as he professed and as the Gospel says, the Savior of the world, and by dying for our sins on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ makes a way for us to be accepted of a holy God, though we have sinned. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. That's words from an old song that I grew up on as a kid. And, and the message says in the chorus, come home, come home. You who are weary, come home earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. And the Lord has cast into your life the message of salvation, of hope, of forgiveness, of everlasting life, that you might respond coming to him 
and find in him that everlasting life that will fit you for heaven. This life that you and I have here today, um, it's, it's wonderful and we enjoy life. I, I hope you're enjoying life, but I have to tell you, the life that you ex have existing in your body today does not suit you for heaven because we get old and this life comes to an end. But what the Lord has for us today by his mercy and grace is everlasting life that fits us, that suits us for everlasting glory and the ability for us to be blessed eternally in his presence. So the story of the sower is essential to understanding the stories, the other parables of the kingdom of God. And so we had a parable in Mark chapter 4 that tells us of the mystery of life within the seed. And I hope you understand that even though you may look at your Bible or you may hear a sermon and it just sounds like words to you, those are beautiful words. Those are wonderful words. Those are wonderful words of life. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to read from verse 24. This is the parable that follows the parable of the sower. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So we've got three stories, three parables involving seed. And by the way, there's others. And the seed is not always the word of God, okay? We're going to find that out. But there's a need for us to understand how to listen and apply parables and the teaching of these stories into our lives so that the meaning, the deeper meaning of these, I mean, they're really, they're, they're simple little stories, a man casts seed into the ground, goes to bed, wakes up, goes to bed, wakes up. The seed grows, uh, and, and he, on harvest day, comes out and harvests what he has planted. And, okay? I mean, there isn't anyone in this room that doesn't understand that. And yet there's deeper meaning here as we look at it in the relationship to the kingdom of God. Here's a person that sows good seed in his field. But while he slept, he's sleeping, and this is similar to the other story we read. But this man, as he's sleeping, he's got an enemy. There's somebody that doesn't like him. And, and by the way, farmers are competitive. Um, I, I don't know what this enemy's problem was. But while this farmer slept, an enemy came with a bunch of weed seed and sowed, it's called tares, he sowed weeds in this man's field amongst his crop. You know, if there's anything that's irritating, because it involves work, it's when you're trying to grow something and maybe you go away for a few days and when you come back, there's all kinds of other things growing up around and amidst the things that you're trying to accomplish. And I mentioned before that tares or weeds will suck the good right out of the ground. And you maybe notice that certain of the most prosperous weeds that you find in a garden or in a farmer's field, they have huge stalks and most of them are quite juicy, which is just an indication that they've been sucking the 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 soil dry. And you're trying to figure out why it is that what you planted isn't doing so well. So while he slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds or tares amongst the wheat, and he went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, oops, the weeds also became obvious. So, the servants of the householder came and they said unto him, Sir, uh, if we remember right, 
You sow good seed. You planted a good seed in the field. Where are all of these weeds coming from? And it must have been very obvious that the weeds growing up in this field, probably prepared very well by the farmer, were the act of an enemy in an attempt to ruin his crop. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Do you want us to go out then and to pull them all up? Do you want us to go and gather those tares? And he said, No. Because as you're pulling them up, as you're gathering the tares, you're going to damage the good. You're going to damage the wheat. You're going to damage the crop for which this purpose was established. And you will root up the wheat also with them. <laughs> um, back to the barn. Um, and in fact, we're going to actually read about mustard seed. But that was one of the things that would grow up in my father's fields. And he would be growing corn or he would be growing uh, wheat, uh, particularly in the bean fields. Um, there would be mustard, wild mustard plants that would grow up. And they had huge stalks on them. They came from this tiny little seed. And yet they grew up into a, into a bush, an actual shrub that you would find birds building their nest in them and underneath them. And my dad would say, look, we've got to go get that mustard out of that corner of the field because it's preventing the beans from receiving sunlight and it's sucking up all the moisture. And we actually had to go out there with linoleum knives and cut those plants off at the root because if we were to pull them up, my goodness, they would pull up four or five bean bushes with them. So there's, need, there's a need for special care in the regard of maintaining the well-being of the crop that you're expecting. And so the farmer says, let them both grow together until the harvest time. And in the time of harvest, I will say to those that go out to harvest, first gather the tares, bind them into bundles to burn them, then gather the wheat into the granary. Hmm. Uh, and, and by the way, it's wonderful what Jesus does here. Uh, just as with the other story about the sower and the seed plots, uh, take a look down to verse 36. After the multitude was sent away, after the crowds were gone, and when it, his disciples went into the house with him, and they said to us, could you explain to us the parable of the weeds, of the tares in the field? Uh, they wanted to, to hear an application. That they wanted Jesus to explain to them the details of this other parable that he had told them. And so he responded and said to them, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's me. Uh, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the devil. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them obviously is the devil. The harvest is the end of the ages. And the reapers are the angels of God. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those that do iniquity, those that are sinful, lawless in their practices. And he shall cast them into judgment, into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. If you've got ears to hear, listen up. Wow. 
Uh, and I, I have to say there's, there's aspects of that story that aren't pleasant to hear. I don't like talking about the judgment of God. I, I don't like making reference to the fact that there is a day at the end of the age when the judgment of God will be expended upon this earth and when those that do not receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, who do not serve God acceptably in his kingdom as believers having received him, they will be destroyed in the judgment of God, the everlasting judgment of God in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. I, I just have to say to you, that as we speak the truth, there is, yes, the blessing of that which comes with obedience and faith, but there is also the bad news for those who reject the wonderful outreach of the Savior, of the love of God, of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross. To reject Him is to lose one's soul forever. And you might say that, uh, well, that's not a real pleasant thing to hear, Pastor Dave. Well, I, I make no apology for it. You know, we sometimes say the truth hurts. And this is a reality that should strike terror into your soul as you consider that there is a consequence for rejecting the outreach, for rejecting the sweet strains of the gospel and the pleadings of the loving Savior who died for your sins, that you might escape the judgment of God. I want you to know that God's purpose and God's will is that all men should be saved and that they should come to the knowledge of the truth. It is not his will that any should perish. And the proof of that is that this loving God who so loved the world he gave his only begotten son has done everything that you might escape judgment. And people who end up in that awful place of judgment are there because of their own decision and because of their own rejection of the love and of the sweet message of God's salvation, of hope and eternal life. I, I, I want to clarify something too. I, I've had people say, and, and this is one of those things that apparently they didn't check out. They, they said, you know, uh, that Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. That's not true. I mean, look, look at these parables of the kingdom. What, what are they speaking of? The kingdom of heaven. They're talking about the joy of the Lord, the eternal blessing that comes upon those who receive Christ as Savior. I want you to know that the promotion of God's glory and of his eternal kingdom far outweigh the warnings of judgment and wrath. But because there is wrath, beware. The Bible says, lest he take you away with a stroke, and then it's too late. A great ransom cannot deliver you. And you have opportunity in this life to respond to the message of the gospel. And what we've read here today in the regard of this judgment that is coming, it's something for us to take seriously. You can read it way back in the days of John the Baptist. Uh, we read this in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12 that John the Baptist spoke of the message of Christ and he spoke of those that would receive him, but he also spoke of those that would reject him and he mentioned the judgment of God in that context. Uh, it shouldn't surprise any of us that when we read from the apocalyptic writings of the book of Revelation, that again, we hear of the angels of the Lord and uh, that portion in Revelation chapter 14 and 14 where the angels of the Lord come forth with the sickle to harvest and to take into the granary that which God has desired for his eternal glory and blessing and for us as well but then we read also of those grapes of wrath that are pressed out in the wine press of God in everlasting judgment so, very serious information that we have here. Um, let's, let's, let's take a look at another one. Let's go down to verse 47. 
I, I'm, I'm not reading them all in their order. We will, we will touch on each of these. But you'll find in each one of these parables a significant truth pertaining to the kingdom of God. I, I know that a person could preach on these for weeks, and I'm not going to do that. I want to just give you the obvious implication of each one of these parables so that you can put these together, these seven parables, and then in the end, uh, the final parable has to do with those that, um, well, um, he, he speaks of those that are instructed in the kingdom of heaven being like a, a man that brings out of his treasure things old and new. And so there's a, there's a, a parable at the end that speaks of what happens in our regard of considering these truths of the kingdom. Well, let's go to verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a fishing net, a net that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. I mean, there were big ones, there were small ones, there were those that I suppose were edible and some that maybe were kind of disgusting. I, I was going to mention crawfish, but I know that uh, that's kind of a delicacy uh, on the Chinese menu. Um, I, I struggle with eating crawdads or crawfish. Uh, but nevertheless, um, he cast his net to take in a draft of fish, which when the net was full, they drew it to shore and sat down and gathered the good into containers, but they discarded, they cast the bad away. Look at verse 49. So shall it be at the end of the age. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus answering said unto them, Do you understand all of these things? And they said unto him, Yes, Lord. Now this story of the net is quite similar to the parable of the wheat and the tares, but it has a significant difference here. And you may be saying in your heart as you're sitting here today, you know, out there in the world, uh, there's just all kinds of people that say that they're Christians, and some of them, I, I look at their life and lifestyle, I look at some of the things that they do and things that they say, and I have to be honest with you, I don't like what I see. I, I've had people that were interested in the message of salvation, and they have been hindered, even offended, by others whose lifestyle, whose behavior, maybe the words of their mouth, their speech, and all of the issues concerning their character threw up a, a negative smoke screen. And I've had people say to me, I, I know a lot of people that say that they're Christians, and i got to be honest with you. I'm not a Christian, and my life is far better. I mean, if you look at how I live, I would never say, I would never do the things that they do. Well, I want you to know that in this net, there is both the good and the bad, and many who say that they're Christians, who say that they're believers, you know, the Bible says by their here we are back to that subject. By their fruit you shall know them. And there is a day of reckoning, just as we read in the parable of the wheat and the tares. There is a day of reckoning when that which professes Christianity, that which professes faith in Christ, those who say that they have come to Jesus and yet there's something that just doesn't add up. There's, there's no fruit in their life and we look at them and let me say to you this morning that if you're struggling because of hypocrites, uh, you need to thank God. Uh, my, my grandfather used to always say, the one thing I like about hypocrites is that they are the evidence that there is also the real thing. And yet they confuse us. They cause us 
many times to struggle with what we're looking at and, and the realities that are around us. Don't let the hypocrite, don't let the individual that might be in the net calling themselves a Christian get in the way of you coming to Christ. There's a day of reckoning, a day where those that today seem to all be gathered up in the same net are going to be sorted out at the return of Christ and the good will be separated. Those that are true will be separated from those that are false, those whose professions are mere words and the good will be separated from the evil and the evil will be discarded and again we read of that fire of judgment where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth I want to close with the question that Jesus asked in verse 51 have you understood all these things I, I guess I could say it the way we say it today are you getting this are these parables, these simple little stories, are they, are they coming together in your mind? Are, are you hearing the word of God and allowing these details of the kingdom to register in your mind and to get deep within your heart so that you're able to have an understanding yourself of what God is saying to you, of what God has for you, of the purpose of the word of God in your life and of this message of the gospel that has been made clear and plain that those who receive Jesus Christ as Savior can experience this everlasting life and the eternal joy of the Lord. I, I hope that today you're serious about this. You might look at this bunch of stories and say, ah, oh, you know. I, I knew all that stuff about gardening before I ever went to church. What are you trying to tell me? No, no, no. Look beyond this to the message of the kingdom, to the details of what God is doing in the big picture. The big picture that has to do with every person that has ever entered into life on this planet Earth. And that God's purpose for you and for all is that you might come to him and receive him as Savior and experience for yourself this wonderful blessing of everlasting life. I, I'm, I'm just going to say to you that if you like this earth, you're going to love heaven. Now there's two places that the Bible tells us that have been created for humankind. Heaven and earth. Uh, I've had people say, well, what, what about this thing called hell? That was... That was created for the devil and his angels. And if you follow him, that's where you'll end up. That was not God's intention. His design for mankind is that we might enjoy this earth and experience the kingdom of God, which is within us in this life, but be surrounded by that blessed kingdom eternally in that home. We say beyond the skies, but in God's new heaven and earth, that place wherein dwells righteousness, and you and I will experience. I mean, if it took God six days to make this earth, he's been working on heaven since Christ left earth, who said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. What a beautiful place heaven must be. Don't miss heaven for this world. And take these stories, simple as they may seem, and allow these simple truths regarding the kingdom of God to dwell deeply in your heart and bring forth fruit unto everlasting life. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the word of God. We have these seven parables, and we have an introduction to them, uh, as well as a, a closing parable that helps us to understand our own responsibility and the things that come to us by way of blessedness through hearing your word and allowing it to dwell in our hearts and to produce fruit unto everlasting life and eternal joy. I ask you that today, whether young or old, there wouldn't be anyone here 
that would take these stories and allow them to just be ignored for how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And I ask that the word of God today would get deep into the hearts of each one and bear forth fruit, that they might fulfill the word of God by being saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth. It is not your will that any should perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Father, speak that life into the hearts of each one here today and around the world. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.